You can go ahead and open up your Bibles with me to Galatians chapter 3. We will continue on in the book. If you've uh, been with me the last two times that I've taught, we have gone through Galatians 1 and also Galatians 2, and that brings us now to Galatians 3, as that usually happens. And... uh, If you've been with me in in the first couple chapters, if not, feel free to uh, listen online or grab a CD from the sound booth. I definitely encourage you to. And uh, the only reason is because the book of Galatians is such an awesome, mighty book. There's so much packed within its pages. Um, The book of Galatians, and, and I usually throw this out there for a lot of the books that I teach, but I always try to remember little words, right? So Corinthians, carnal and all that. When I think of Galatians, I think of grace, And that will help you to remember what the book of Galatians is all about. And so far we've uh, seen Paul uh, introduce himself back to the Galatians and greet them. We've seen him uh, share a little bit of his testimony. And now at this point we will get into uh, chapter 3. And I pray that you are just blessed with me as we uh, go along here and continue on in the book. Let's go ahead and read though verses 1 through 5 and then we'll pray. It says, O foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain. Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Let's pray. Once again, Lord, we lift up the book of Galatians to you now. And Father, we lift up really our hearts to you, God. And we ask, God, that you would begin to just peel back, Lord, uh, the, the parts of our heart, God, that are getting in the way from you touching us, Lord, from you truly coming down and having that deep relationship with us, Father. We ask, Lord, that you would peel back our hearts like you would peel back an onion, Father. We pray, Lord, that you would just break down the walls, God, that are needed to be broken so that you can just reach us, Lord. And we lift up uh, just this doctrine of grace, Father, that we are saved uh, only through your riches, only through the work that you did on the cross and nothing uh, of what we can do. And we thank you for that, Lord that you have no uh, requirement of us physically, God, other than to believe. And we ask, God, that this doctrine, Lord, would be real, it would be true in our lives, and that, Father, we would just live it, Lord, that we would proclaim it, Father, with every action, Lord. We lift this up in your name. Amen. Amen. At this point, again, here in the book of Galatians, Paul has turned from his testimony of grace to explaining or examining grace. Again, if you go back in chapters one and two, he speaks a lot about where he came from, about his conversion, and about the grace of God that has uh, taken place in his life and what it has done to change him. He has defended his own life, he's defended his position, and he has shared his testimony. And now he will begin to explain the difference between grace and the law, grace and the law, which both come from God. And I want you to remember that or to highlight that, that both the grace and the law come from God. Let's read again in verse one. It says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? So as Paul finishes speaking about his ignorance of grace in the previous chapters, uh, he begins with the foolishness of the Galatians. And you know, there's a big difference between ignorance and foolishness. Big difference. And I don't as so much mind ignorance as I do foolishness, right? The word ignorance just means without knowledge. If you look that word up, ignorance, or to be ignorant of something, it just means to be without knowledge. To be without, uh, uh, to be without knowledge or to be ignorant it, up to a certain extent is okay, right? 
you know, we're all ignorant of something in life, aren't we? We are all lacking knowledge in some area. You know, if you ask me to help you with your car, you know, I don't know why you would, but if you ask Roman, my car won't start. Can you help me out? You know, I would uh, maybe check the connections to the battery. You know, I'd probably stick the key in there and turn it a couple more times. But that is probably the extent of my knowledge in helping you out on why your car will not start, right? So I'm ignorant up to or after that point. But if you take your car to a mechanic and you say, you know, Mr. Mechanic, my car will not start. Can you help me out? And, you know, the first thing he does is he checks the tire pressure, you know, or he gets under the hood and he starts to check the, the oil, you know, or he jumps on the back of the car testing the shocks. You know, now at this point, we've crossed the line from ignorance to foolishness, right? Now he's just being foolish. That word foolish means lacking a good sense of judgment, lacking a good sense of judgment. You have the knowledge needed, but you choose not to use it properly is what is happening. And Paul starts chapter three here in Galatians with, oh, foolish Galatians. Oh, Galatians who have the information needed. You have the knowledge that is necessary to make the right decision, but you choose not to use it properly. And then he says, who has bewitched you? Who has tricked you so much that it seems like a spell has been cast upon you, like you've been hypnotized? You know, you ever meet somebody like that? Like, man, you can't really be this dumb, right? This has to be an act. You know, this can't be for real. You know, this is how Paul felt, I'm sure, with the Galatians. You know, are you guys sure you're Christians? Are you sure you're believers? Are you sure you're the same Galatians that accepted the grace of God when I was with you the first time? Reading on in verse two, it says, this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So Paul, at this point, then asked the Galatians a number of questions. Five questions to be exact. And let's break down these questions here. First question. He says, did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Did salvation come by being a holy, righteous person? Did it have anything to do with you keeping the commandments of God or was it by simply believing in the work of Christ? This is what Paul is asking. To which our answer would be, of course, by Christ, right? The latter. Second question Paul asks is, are you so foolish? Let me interpret this for you. He says, are you a big dummy pretty much, right? This is what he's asking them. Are you lacking a good sense of judgment? Are you lacking that judgment that is needed? Are you being completely foolish? Are you making the wrong decision that is needed here? To which our answer would be yes. Yes, they are. Question number three, Paul says, have you begun in the spirit or having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? If your salvation basically is what Paul's saying, if your salvation came by the work that Christ did, are you now trying to obtain perfection by your own hands? Have you been uh, trying to take back that control from God. You gave it to him at one point. Are you now trying to take control back from the Lord into your own hands? He then asked the question, have you suffered so many things in vain if indeed it was in vain? He's saying, Is it, was it all for nothing? Was it all for nothing? And then the last question, he says, therefore, he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Does God work only in your perfection? Or does he work when you simply say, here I am, Lord. Here I am, take me. I know it's not much, but it's what I have to offer you. 
I'm a sinner, I've messed up, but Lord, work through me. And we can look at these questions and say, you know, Paul, they're really rhetorical questions. Of course, we have the right answers, right? I'm sure the Galatians had the right answers to all of these questions. But Paul asked the questions for a reason. He asked the questions because these were issues, these were specific issues and problems that the Galatians were dealing with at this point in time. Of course the Lord, you know, working isn't bound to me keeping the law or being perfect. Why? Because, well, then the Lord would never work. You know, he'd never begin the work that's needed because I'm, I'm never perfect. But the Galatians were struggling with the desire to take back that control from the Lord into their own hands to try to work for that perfection. And the only question that was really yet to be revealed was number four, and that was, was it all in vain? Was it all for nothing? See, the Galatians were dealing with legalism there in uh, their day and age. As the Jews came down uh, into Galatia, they were starting to spread the doctrine of legalism. And, and once again, uh, uh, the fact that yes you, are, yes, you can be a Christian, yes, you can believe in Christ, but you must follow the, the laws and the rules and the rituals that the Jews had set forth that were found in the Jewish religion. They were dealing with this legalism there. Nowadays, you could call it humanism. The thought that the power lies with us rather than with God. Like if we have something to do with our salvation, right? One of the biggest threats to Christianity is humanism thinking that the power, once again, lies uh, within us. And it's, it's all lies from the enemy is what it is. It's the same old lies, you know, just a different generation. Satan will come and try to uh, kill, steal, and destroy, as the word says, in any way possible. And that is even getting us to believe that God is powerless. Maybe the Galatians had all the right answers. You know, they could answer every one of Paul's questions uh, correctly. Maybe they would have aced the test. But they definitely were not living in such a way. They weren't living out what they knew to be the truth. And it brought a response from Paul to say, oh, foolish Galatians. Let's read ahead. It says uh, here in verse six through nine, just as Abraham believed God, but it was accounted to him for righteousness. Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying in you, all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So Paul says, even Abraham's righteousness was accounted to him, not by anything that he could do, not that anything that he had done, not by any works of the law, but only through the Lord, only by believing in the work of God. And if you know your Bible timeline, your uh, chronology, uh, you'll know that Abraham was about 500 years, 430 years to be exact, before the law, before Moses, right? Abraham came before Moses, roughly 500 years. So how could Abraham have been made righteous by the law? The law had not been established. The law had never been delivered by the hands of Moses. So we know that perfection could not have come through the law, right? Perfection could only have come or righteousness could only have come through believing in the Lord. And likewise, those that believe in God are blessed with Abraham, it says. It says that they are heirs according to the same promise, that same promise that was given to Abraham. You know, on the contrary, the scriptures could read just as Moses had the law, so it was accounted to him for righteousness. It could say, therefore, now that only those who are of the law of Moses will be made righteous. Praise God that it wasn't in this manner that God decided to bring salvation. Thank God that it wasn't by the law that he chose to bring perfection to humanity, but it was by the work that Christ did on the cross. Why? Because we mess up once and there it goes, right? 
There goes all chances. There goes all hope. There brings the separation and the guilt and the condemnation. You know, we're, we'd always be striving for forgiveness. We've all, we would always be striving for salvation. You know, are you going to heaven? I don't know. We'll find out when I get there. You know, we'll find out when I die type of thing. There'd be no assurance of salvation. You know, it's interesting that every religion in the world is in this boat. There is no assurance of salvation for anyone other than the believer in Jesus Christ. And it's so funny because from the Jew to the Muslim, they're in the same boat. It is all based on works. Instead, the scripture has preached from the beginning, from the very beginning since the time of Abraham, once again, prior to the introduction of the law with Moses, that those who simply believe, I want you to write that word in there, that phrase in chapter three, simply believe are sons of Abraham and therefore sons of righteousness, it says. Read with me in verse 10. It says, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles to Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. This is something as a believer to be extremely excited about. This right here is our hope. This right here is our everything. This destroys every religion out there. You want to be saved by works? You want salvation to come by works? Fine, go for it. Have at it. But the scripture says, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things, in all things, which are written in the book of the law to do them. Why did Paul write the book of Galatians. If you were with us in chapter one, you would have underlined verse six, which says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. He marveled that they were turning away from the grace. Anything that is not the grace of Christ is a different gospel, Paul said. And Paul says here that if you want to turn to a different method for salvation, if you want to strive for heaven, if you want to strive by works, have at it. But you're going to be striving for that righteousness. You're going to be striving for acceptance. And you know what? You're never going to to be able to obtain it. Why? Because you have to uh, you have to um, complete and fulfill every part of the law. You better not lie. You better not steal. You better not disrespect your elder. You better not commit any type of sexual sin. Put anything before God. Have a carved image. Take the name of the Lord in vain. Not murder. Not covet your na- anything of your neighbors. And you better keep the Sabbath. And you mess up in one of these areas. And that's it. You're done. You're cursed. You're cursed. There is no ho- hope at that point. He says that it's so evident that nobody can keep the law and that therefore nobody is justified by the law. Anyone meet anyone that's ever kept the law? Uh, It's so evident, right? It's like, well, duh, we can't keep the law. No one can be considered a good person by their works. Anyone in here a good person? Don't raise your hand. No one in here, I'm sorry. That's harsh, Roman. I thought I was a good person. Sorry, take it up with the Lord. According to the law, according to the standard that Christ has in our own works. But the exciting thing is, is that Christ has given us a way out. The word in here says that he has become cursed for us. He has hung on that tree so that we wouldn't have to. 
Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He didn't come in opposition of the law, but he came as a fulfillment of the law so that we could believe in him and in his righteousness and that the law would no longer demand anything of us. It would no longer have any reign over us. It would no longer have any control over us. Again, he didn't come in opposition to it. He didn't come to destroy it. He came to fulfill what it was requiring. Read with me verse 15. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men. Though it is only a man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed, who is Christ. And this I say, that the law which was 430 years later cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. So Paul is saying that even in a man's contract, even in an earthly or a worldly contract, that once it is confirmed, it cannot be altered, it cannot be changed. That is the contract uh, that needs to be adhered to. And the promise of salvation by grace alone through Christ, uh, once again, came 430 years before the law. And as the law came, it did not annul or cancel out the previous contract that we already had, that was already established with Abraham. It was a promise that was made that the seeds, that the sons of Abraham, those who believe in the same manner of Abraham, will be heirs of the same promise. It's like a father saying, son, I promise to give you all of my assets when I die. You know, he makes out a will for the son and, and this is going to be your inheritance, inheritance, son. You know, I get the Camaro, you know, it's like he feels, you know, and the son goes out and, and the son starts to party, starts to spend like crazy and he starts to just live this life that is not worthy of, of the inheritance that was promised to him. So what would normally happen? Well, mom would come along, right? Because mom's usually the law. And as mom comes, she says, son, you have to stop living this way. You have to start following these rules that will be established that are worthy of the inheritance that the Father has for you. And that is a picture of the law. Rules that are worthy of the inheritance. But is it not still dad's will that will give the son the inheritance? See, by following the law that mom has established, by following the rules that mom sets up, we're still not going to obtain the inheritance through that what is the inheritance received from? It is still by the will of the Father. Verse 18 says, For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. If the son received the inheritance by following mom's rules, it would no longer be by the will of the Father. But we know that it comes through the will of the Father, whether the son follows mom's rules or not. Just because there's a law or there are rules that need to be followed, doesn't mean that anything is actually obtained by them or from them. Well, why then a law? I'm glad you asked. Verse 19, read with me. It says, what purpose then does the law serve? Why then a law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator does not mediate for only one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promise of God or the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been given 
by, or would have been by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin that the promises by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept under guard by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. Wait till your father gets home. How many of you guys ever heard that? I know you all did. We all heard that as kids, right? Wait till your father gets home. If we would have followed mom's rules to the T, we still would not have received dad's inheritance by those rules first off because well we couldn't have followed them right it would be impossible to follow mom's rules 100 percent. why because mom just has high standards she expects a lot from her kids right and second because again it's dad's will that has already been established for the inheritance well why then the law why then the rules from mom uh, before dad gets home? Uh, I love what verse 22 says there. It says, but the scripture has confined all under sin that the promise of, uh, by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. If there was no law, then there would be no need for Christ. The law is what has imprisoned everyone. It has confined everybody under it. And it gave us the opportunity for salvation to be given through Christ, through the believing in Christ, through faith in Christ. And in verse 24, Paul says that the law was our guardian. Because if not, we would have lived a completely contrary life to the inheritance that was waiting for us, you know? Just as a guardian, Paul says, it was set up. Just as a tutor, it was set up. It was set up as that protection for us so we don't kill ourselves before dad gets home. Sometimes we need those rules in life, right? Just to keep us from killing ourselves. And when we finally see dad's will, though, and believe in it, it all becomes real. That promise from dad becomes reality. We start to live in a manner that is worthy of receiving it. Why? Because of our joy because of our belief in what dad has for us. No longer in need of mom nagging us with all the rules all the time, right? No longer, don't hit your brother. Why? Well, you're not gonna hit your brother anymore, you know? Because your, your eyes are set on the inheritance. No longer, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not murder. Why? Because our eyes are on the inheritance. We're already naturally following the law. We're naturally following the things that it has for us. The law was introduced because of our transgressions, because of our sins. But once Christ came, uh, the original covenant came to fruition. It was put in place once again. It became real to us. Does that mean that the law is contrary to Christ? No, not at all. It just came as a guardian until Christ came. Why did mom always say, wait till your father gets home? Because when dad got home, reality set in right oh no all the things that we did throughout the day became a reality the difference is is that if you're a son or a daughter a believer when dad gets home when the lord returns he's not returning to punish you he's returning to give you your inheritance and that's the awesome thing about christianity god is a god that desires to restore and to give good gifts, not to condemn. As believers, we should naturally be following the law. So many times, we, we're not under the law. That's the Old Testament, you know. We don't need to follow those rules. No, we should naturally be following those rules. God's law should be in our hearts. We should be waiting for the anticipation of the Father's return. Verse 26 says, For if in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, 
then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So how does this apply to me? How does this apply to us as believers in 2016? Well, once again, if you're a born again believer, if you've put your trust in Jesus Christ, uh, if you have put Christ on like the Galatians claim to be, then you have been baptized into Christ. You have obtained the grace, the riches that come along with this. You have obtained the knowledge needed and you've become a son or a daughter of Christ. There's no longer a need for a guardian or the law in your life. And that's not to say that we get to do whatever we want. It's to say that we're already doing what the Lord wants us to be doing. We're already in his will. You're already not stealing and lying and backbiting and causing fights and full of malice and anger and, you know, living in a drunken, chaotic, worldly life. There's a clear separation between the darkness and the light. It's now become natural to us. And if it isn't natural to you, then you need to ask yourself, have I been baptized in Christ? Have I put on Christ? Christ? Am I a child of Christ? And if the answer is no, don't let it draw you away from him. Let it drive you to him. Let it drive you to his forgiveness. Let it drive you to following him and for that desire to put on Christ and to do the things that he has for you. Verse 20 and 29, again, it says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female for you are all one in christ jesus and if you are christ then you are abraham's offspring heirs according to promise christianity breaks all barriers the jew fought against the greek they were enemies they hated each other the slave against the free the male against the female, as it says there in verse 28. The Jews have one God, Jehovah. The Greeks had many, right? The slave, well, he was a slave. The free was his master. The male was a controlling, oppressive overlord. And the female wanted to be the controlling, oppressive overlord. She wanted that position of the male. And Paul says no more. No longer is there a separation. No longer are there walls that are set up between humanity. But now we are all one in Christ. We don't deprive ourselves of good things, right? We take care of ourselves, don't we? We get ourselves, you know, only the, only the best things and, and, uh, and we, just, we just take care of number one. We need to take care of of one another we need to put each other first paul said we're all one in christ we're no longer you know uh, there's no longer a a hierarchy there's no longer uh, an established you know ladder we're all on one even plane before the lord's eyes verse 29 and if you are christ then you are abraham's offspring heirs according to promise you already have the inheritance promise to you we just need to live like it we just need it to become reality within our lives too many believers nowadays are taking full advantage of grace they're taking full advantage of the lord's uh, uh wait the lord waiting to come home waiting for his return too many are not heeding the warning that the father is going to return soon john ten twenty seven. jesus said my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. They follow me. See, Instagram didn't create follow me. Jesus created follow me. We need to hit that follow me button, you know, and follow Jesus. A lot of us are following many different things in life. We're following the voice of today, you know. We're following you know, Oprah and Warren Buffett and Seventeen Magazine and, you know, whatever thing we can get information from. We need to follow Jesus. If you're a Christian, you should know the voice of the Lord and you should be seeking after the voice of the Lord in your life. Lord, which way do I go, left or do I go right? 
well, let's uh, check the economy in that state and this area and let's see what's going on here. And No, let's take it before the Lord. God, what do you have for me? Lord, where are you calling me to go? 1 Corinthians 15, 52 says, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Jesus is returning. Amen? He's coming soon. And I don't think there's a minute to waste.